Hey everyone, welcome back to the second part of our series on some of the research we're doing with black nose shark. Last time we spoke a little bit about sampling and tagging these sharks in the field. And this time we're gonna talk about how we find these little tags after they popped off the sharks. And then also look at what these sharks have actually been up to when they're released. All right, so the tags that we're gonna be looking for were put out on sharks that we sampled off of Cape Canaveral, Florida. And we're gonna start searching for these tags right in that same area where they were released. Now to find these tags, we're gonna rely upon this receiver right here to pick up the beep or the ping that's coming from the tag. And that sound is gonna come from this part right here, which is called the VHF transmitter. So when we turn on the receiver, this is the sound that we're listening for. Okay, and again, that's the sound we're listening for when we're out on the water looking for these tags. So when I'm out on the water, the first thing I'll do is tune the receiver to the frequency of the tag I'm looking for. So think of this like tuning a radio to your favorite station. And I'll also set the sensitivity of the receiver to its highest setting. And what this will do is it allows me to detect a tag as far away as 10 miles. Next, the headphones go on, the antenna comes out, and I listen for that ping of the tag that lets me know the tag is floating at the surface and we're within range. But now is the tricky part, trying to lead a boat over miles of ocean to find a tiny tennis ball sized tag. But luckily, there's a pretty simple method we can use to find these tags. All I have to do is sweep the antenna back and forth and wherever the antenna is pointing when the ping is the loudest is the general direction of the tag. So take a look at this animation, listen for the tag, and let's see if you can figure out which direction we need to go. All right, let's see if you would have set me in the right direction to find this tag. This is the direction you had in mind. Nice job, you're spot on. So when I'm out on the water, I'll repeat this sort of search pattern over and over again. And as we move closer to the tag, reduce the receiver's sensitivity to give me an idea of just how close we are to the tag. And eventually, when I can hear the tag at its lowest sensitivity, the tag is somewhere within sight, and after a few minutes of scanning the surface, we'll be able to find and recover the tag. Sweet. Now after we've recovered all these tags, which can sometimes take a while when the sharks decide to swim in completely different directions, which happens a lot, but after we've recovered these tags, the next step is manually downloading them. Now if you remember from the last post, I hinted that this tag is from a shark that had a really interesting story. But I actually have another tag with me here today um, from a shark that had a completely different story. So I'm going to go ahead and download the data from both of these tags and then we can look at what happened to these sharks together after they were released. Okay, so all of the data is downloaded. Now let's check it out. Okay, so for each shark, we're gonna look at their movement over time using two graphs. In the top graph, you'll see how the shark's moving up and down in the water column. And then in this bottom graph, you're actually gonna see the shark's tail beats that we've calculated from acceleration data. So basically think of this white line as being the center of the shark. And then the data will show the movement of the tail back and forth across that center line as the shark swims along. So it's pretty much the same idea as this animation I have here. Now let's look at the data from one of these tags and we're gonna start with the shark whose movement and behavior is actually very similar to almost all of the sharks we've tagged so far in this project. Now this shark was caught with standard fishing practices and under normal conditions. And after it was released, what you'll see is that it actually showed this behavior where it swam straight down to the sea floor and pretty much hung out down there for 10 to 15 minutes. And we actually think this may have been a brief recovery period. So very similar to one of us running a sprint and then having to slow down and catch our breath afterwards. So it's the same idea. After this, the shark appears to have recovered because it starts to show what we've learned to be normal swimming behavior for this species. And it actually shows this behavior for the remaining 20 plus hours that we monitor this shark. 
Now, if you take a look at its tail beats, so that bottom graph, I also want to point out that the back and forth motion also remained almost the exact same the entire time, except for this spike circled right here. And at this point, we see that back and forth motion or the amplitude increase. So that just means that the shark accelerated for just a second for whatever reason, right before going back into normal swimming for the remainder of the monitoring period. So all in all, the movement and behavior of this shark and most of the sharks we've tagged tells us that recreational fishing doesn't appear to have a huge impact on their short-term health, which is fantastic. But it still doesn't mean that all of the sharks survive. So keeping that in mind, let's look at the data from the tag that I hinted at having a really interesting story. Now, this shark was fought longer than usual and it actually swallowed the hook. And we know from previous studies that both of these can actually impact the health and behavior of the shark after they're released. So right after the shark was released, it was very disoriented, swam at the surface for a while, had trouble remaining upright, but eventually it did return back to the sea floor. And it looks like it went into that sort of recovery period that I mentioned before going back into what appears to be normal swimming behavior or so we thought. So if we fast forward about six hours, we can see everything changed. Okay, now here we can see the shark goes from normal swimming to these massive bursts in acceleration that we can see from the tail beat data in the bottom graph. So this shark was moving at this point, probably trying to get away from something bigger like a predator. And that same day in the same area, we actually did catch larger predatory sharks like this adult sand tiger shark and several black tip sharks. So we see these massive spikes in acceleration data. And then after this, the tag shows a completely different movement behavior in both graphs. So basically what this means, and you may have guessed it, is that this black nose shark was actually eaten by a larger shark. And what you're seeing after this is just the movement of that larger shark. So to sort of prove this, Check out the tag after it was recovered. You can see it has bite marks all over it. So clearly this shark was eaten. All right, so to wrap this up, while most of the sharks that we've tagged survive capture and handling, there's always that chance that a few of them won't make it, whether that's because they were eaten right after being released, just like this last shark, or because of more extreme fishing practices like fighting an animal for a really long period of time, which may just be too stressful for that shark. But all in all, it appears that this fishing really doesn't have too much of an impact on this species overall, which is great news. And so on that high note, I just want to thank you all for taking the time to learn a little bit about this research that we're doing. I really hope you enjoyed it, and I encourage you all to stay tuned to the Aquarium social media to learn more about some of the other exciting research projects that we have going on. So yeah, that's all I have for today. Thanks again.